It is October 25th, 2017, and I am here with Dr. Daryl Salk at the CDC Recording Studio in Atlanta. First, let me say welcome, Dr. Salk. Thank you. And thank you for agreeing to participate in the Global Health Chronicles Oral History of Polio Project. I'm very happy to do it. Before we begin, would you please tell us a little bit about your background? It's semi-complicated. <laughs> I, uh, uh, as I was leaving high school, um, I was planning to go to Stanford and do uh, bio biological sciences, probably pre-med, and I then got an offer for a scholarship for a very prestigious drama, drama academy, acting academy, which surprised me but delighted me. I had been doing acting for a long time. I had to make a choice. I ended up going to Stanford and following uh, the medical course. Uh, I ended up after uh, Johns Hopkins doing my training, I ended up in Seattle, the Children's Orthopedic Hospital there, uh, and I uh, got my specialty uh, in uh, pediatrics. I love working with kids, they're just wonderful people. And uh, then I went into a laboratory and worked with biology of aging in a pathology department. Very confusing. <laughs> and then after a while, I left and went to, into biotechnology industry, where I was involved in the development of brand new products, monoclonal antibodies, uh, gene therapy, and so forth. As I approached my 60th birthday, I decided I finally knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. So since then, I've been doing some acting. Interesting. So you did some research along the way. Mm. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, I will talk about the uh, polio research that I did. Um, I got interested in uh, polio because uh, my, it was my generation which had some of the last uh, smallpox virus inoculations. Uh, because in uh, 1971, I think it was, they stopped using smallpox vaccine because the risks associated with it were larger than the benefits. Um, it just worked out that way with how much smallpox exposure people had. So they stopped it in the United States, kept it up elsewhere in the world, and then eventually uh, were able to, uh, CDC did a, a global eradication program and uh, were able to declare that there were no more smallpox viruses anywhere in the world. Well, this total eradication is clearly the uh, best ounce of protection, prevention, uh, as opposed to having to do all of those cures. So it's very efficient, <laughs> it's not there. And this was something that was in my head. Uh, and I knew that uh, polio vaccines were working, and I wondered, why not? Why not do the same thing with the with the polio virus? Just get rid of it. And this was in oh, uh, around nineteen oh, around nineteen seventy five, seventy six, when I was in training. Mm -hmm. So you began your research on polio then. Mm -hmm. And before you start talking about that research, would you explain the terms you use for the two types of vaccine? Yeah, there, there are two uh, polyvirus vaccines. Uh, the first one uh, was developed and start, began use in 1955 was the killed poliovirus vaccine. Uh, the technical term for it is inactivated, um, which means killed. Uh, and it was given by injection. Uh, that was developed by Dr. Jonas Salk and his team and a huge number of people uh, throughout the country who participated in that. Uh, the other vaccine is an attenuated vaccine. That means uh, it is weakened. The virus is still alive and it grows once it's been administered orally. Um, uh, and it grows and... and induces immunity. That began to be used in the United States in 1961, not 1962, actually. Um, 
my preference because typically they've been called IPV and OPV. I got in the habit a while ago of referring to, instead of IPV, uh, inactivated, which is not something anybody understands, killed, poliovirus vaccine, and live, poliovirus vaccine. It's just balanced, it makes, it's clear to me, killed and live, those are the important characteristic differences of the vaccines. Mm. And when you started your research, what did you know about polio other than those things? And, and uh, did you have a specific focus in mind? Um, I knew basics about it. Um, when I was in medical school, uh, I heard a number of things that were said, stated by professors that I, I wondered about because it didn't mesh with my growing up, what I heard. And basically one time in a lecture, a, a, a virology professor said, made a very big point about uh, uh, Non-infectious vaccines, like the killed poliovirus vaccine, are not as good as infectious vaccines, like the live poliovirus vaccine. So I went up to him afterward and just asked for some references. And I went to the library and I looked those up and they had nothing to do <laughs> with the question. It's a little frustrating. Um, I was in a uh, pathology work session at one point which was talking about vaccines, and the uh, leader of that session made a statement that was so outrageous. Uh, I, I don't even remember what it was. It was something like, they stopped using the killed vaccine because it didn't work anymore, and started using the live vaccine. I said, that's not true. <laughs> so I had questions about what the truth was, what the facts were, so I asked my father, Jonas, uh, and he explained a little bit to me, and he sent me uh, a book of all of his reprints, all his publications. So I started to look at that and gathered, uh, you know, the, the basics, sort of an introduction, kind of polio 101. I knew enough to be able to talk to somebody about it. I then went in my senior year of medical school, just before graduation, I went to Atlantic City to visit my dad and uh, at a American College of Physicians meeting. And it was fun, it was very interesting. And we had a two minute conversation on the boardwalk at one point because I was aware that people like my generation having grown up with eradication of smallpox, and without having what I knew to be uh, baggage from the 1950s and, and all the controversy that happened, that this was a new generation, and that people would be able to look at information and facts, which is what I was interested in. I, su I suggested to Jonas that he uh, perhaps should get back in, because he had moved out of the subject in uh, 1960s, early 60s, uh, because it was, so fr it was frustrating to him what happened then. And I thought, I said, it's about time you got back into this, because there's a new world out there. It's a, the fertile ground. It's different. And he said, you know, I know somebody at science that might be interested in that. And so that went on to... Uh, uh, to be a story about uh, control of influenza and poliomyelitis with non-infectious vaccines. Uh, my father had worked on uh, influenza before uh, working on polio. And his basic principle was you can, uh, non-infectious materials can cause a good immune reaction. So he started writing this paper. I helped him with basically editing. He would spent a lot of money to teach me how to go to school and how to write. Um, and so I helped him with that. And as time went on, we continued working, um, I really learned a lot. I got pretty well educated and I started 
uh, making contributions of my own to the to the work, collaborative work. Uh, I, I was actually probably his most harsh critic because I could say anything I wanted to, and you know, if he said something that I said, you know, prove it. Where's, where's the where's the data for that? You know, why do you say that? And because of my experience with smallpox, I said to him, you know, why, why don't we say something in here about uh, eradicating polio virus? He said, no, 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 no. He said, we can't say that. I said, why not? He said, because they'll come back, come back at me with, you know, well, there's natural reservoirs because there are monkeys and all kinds of things. And, you know, it's be a big, it'd be silly. I said, but what do you think? Is it true? Could it be done? He said, oh, yeah. <laughs> I said, then why can't we say it? So uh, eradication of polio virus in a 1977 science article was mentioned, as far as I know, for the first time. Um, he also had been using uh, a, a word as he was working with Charles Marieux, the Marieux Foundation in France, to develop a standardized potency uh, vac killed uh, vaccine. Together, they uh, when they talked about things, they used they made up the word vaccinology, and it had a loose sort of meaning. And uh, it, during while we were writing the science paper, I said, "Okay, let's create." As I created a definition for it, <laughs> you know, a description of it, and. Uh, actually, like everything else in the science paper, <laughs> nothing was recognized really or picked up. Um, my father's papers tended to be uh, ignored by, or whatever, didn't make much impact on others in the, in, uh, the field. Um, so we had this concept of vaccinology that we applied. Uh, and again, I think that was a, probably the first place uh, 1977 in the science article that that showed up mm -hmm. in the literature. So I guess I ended up, after having done polio 101, uh, I graduated uh, from a you know, higher degree program and after that began to ask questions myself and ask the question about why can't we eradicate polio? Why we can't possibly eradicate it using a live virus vaccine because you're constantly seeding viruses back into the community. And the viruses are not stable. They revert to virulence. It's a very well-known phenomenon. So that's not the way. You know, it's just biologically not possible. <laughs> um, and so I wondered Okay, what was the experience in the United States uh, with polio, with both vaccines? And so I had been getting the MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Reports. It's a, a CDC publication which about all the important infectious disease things that are happening in the country. And so I started tracking the data that were reported there on polio. And I went to the library, and I went back through all of the early issues, back in, when it, before it was the Epidemic Intelligence Service. Uh, uh, it was the National Poliomyelitis Surveillance Unit. Um, and in fact, it was during the polio academics and the development of the killed vaccine that that unit was created which eventually became and grew into what is now the Epidemic Intelligence Service. So I was going back into old musty stuff, and I charted what the experience was, what the total incidence of polio was over time. And this was the kind of simple graph that comes out of it, and that is that over time, you can see, the killed vaccine was introduced here, KPV, and it uh, the uh, incidence declined. At this point, live polio virus vaccine, LPV, 
uh, was introduced, but both were being used. And at this point, uh, lie, uh, killed vaccine was pretty much stopped being used in this country, so it was only live vaccine. Well, this, this didn't really tell me much. It was hard, it's kind of plateaus here, but you can't really tell what's going on. So I decided to uh, see if I could separate out the live virus vaccine associated disease, now today called VAP, or vaccine associated paralytic poliomyelitis, uh, and separate that from the wild virus disease and see what would happen. Well, it turns out that it really wasn't very clear. It, the uh, live vaccine associated polio kind of went all over the place. And I realized it was because the CDC used an epidemiological definition for vaccine associated polio. Uh, in other words, there had to be a recognized exposure, a documented exposure to the live virus vaccine for it to be considered uh, uh, vaccine associated, which makes perfectly good sense. But there were a, a lot of people who may didn't didn't have a documented exposure, and as technology improved, and CDC laboratory was able to specify the derivation of different viruses, they could identify viruses that had come from the vaccine. So vaccine-derived virus, and they could distinguish that from wild polio virus because it had certain genetic markers, surface markers. But that knowledge had not ever been translated into a definition. So I said, okay, I worked through a whole lot of details about what the different antigens were, what it, what, what it meant, and which what really is appropriate to decide that's vaccine associated. Uh, one doesn't know for sure it's probably va not vaccine associated. And I was delighted to see that when doing that with the revised data, I, I basically created a new definition uh, of vaccine associated polio and for defined the uh, um, kinds of people who, receive, who were paralyzed, recipients, known contacts, and indirect community contacts. These were people that were just out in the neighborhood or had no known exposure. And this black line here is um, the wild poliovirus disease. Killed vaccine was introduced here, and it went down pretty much in a straight line. This is on a logarithmic graph. And live poliovirus vaccine was introduced here, and it has pretty much a plateau, a continued constant level. Um, I thought, that's an important piece of information. <laughs> um, because wild poliovirus disease, which was reduced, it's a logarithmic scale, so it may not look like it to you, but this is, uh, this is a 95% reduction between here and here. Um, and it's a straight line, which means it's first order kinetics. Uh, it's logical, it makes sense. An individual is either immunized or not immunized. Uh, and uh, there's no change. When, when live virus vaccine is introduced, there's no change in the slope of this curve, the straight line, which means that there's no difference of the effect of one vaccine from the other. Killed virus vaccine reduced it at this rate. And when both vaccines were there, it continued at the same rate. Whether that was because it was the influence of killed vaccine or live vaccine, doesn't matter. There was no difference in that. 
this graph also showed that we had essentially eradicated wild polio virus in the United States in the early mid-70s. It, it was gone. Uh, there were occasional scattered cases. There were mostly imported. Well, there, were, uh, there was a small outbreak of imported uh, polio in a community which practiced not getting vaccinated at all. But we already had achieved eradication. Uh, that, seemed, that seemed an important piece of information. And to confirm it, I went to uh, the literature and looked up uh, the European experience. This black line is the total number of cases in the US. And it's, as you see, the live vaccine associated cases are included because it this plateau is built in. That was the first graph I showed you. In England and Wales, this pink line, where only uh, uh, where kill virus vaccine was used for a while, and then it was switched to only live vaccine, similar to what happened in the United States, it had the same shape. Makes sense. In Finland and Sweden, where they never used the live virus vaccine, they only used killed virus vaccine, there was a straight line decline. Uh, and when, when you adjust for the different size populations so that you can compare them, this is wild poliovirus disease, the black line in the United States, the red line in Sweden and Finland. They're the same. Uh, this looks like uh, Sweden and Finland gets, uh, uh, clears off faster, but that's because of the different sizes and populations and the number of people and how it appears on a, uh, uh, on a log, logarithmic graph. So that was confirmation of the patterns that I had seen uh, in here, and I again thought that's kind of important. I wonder why nobody's reported this, nobody's talked about it. Um, especially the concept of, uh, of the eradication indeed is possible. <laughs> We've done it, the Scandinavian countries did it. Um, and I, I wondered why nobody had commented on the straight line uh, persistent level of vaccine-associated disease that interfered with the, uh, basically, the, the disappearance of the wild virus. As I said earlier, well, you kept feeding into the population living viruses, which in and of themselves are unstable and uh, the, when it passes through the gut, take it orally, the virus grows in the intestines uh, and it's excreted. And when that happens, the attenuated virus that goes in one end retain, recovers some of its wild type virulence. So the virus that comes out the other end uh, would not meet the safety standards of released uh, live vaccine. Um, and so that's where why people, both people who received it uh, and people who came in contact with them uh, were, would come down with polio. Um, I wondered, <laughs> this, this is a very simple <laughs> analysis. I mean, I'm not a genius, I just like putting numbers onto paper, and I, I wondered why that hadn't been uh, noticed before. So what did you do with that information after you found it? Well, I published a series of three papers. As I started to uh, think about it and look at it. About what year was that? Uh, 
this was in the 1979, 78, 79 that I, that I was doing this. Um, and the, there were discussions throughout the population uh, and you know, among uh, regulators and, and policymakers about which vaccine was appropriate. And this was the controversy of the 1950s, uh, which the media loved <laughs> because there's a controversy, Salk versus Saban, and they made, could make a big deal out of it. Um, that was coming on again to a large extent because my father had started his activities again and trying to point out to people that this was what kind of stuff was going on. Um, and he started working with uh, Europeans to standardize and come up with a vaccine that would be as potent as the vaccine he produced in his laboratory, reference vaccine A, and to move toward tests to see whether it could be potent enough to be effective with a single dose. Um, so there was, you know, noise about it, and, and uh, you know, there were several committees that met uh, and uh, just to evaluate the difference between the two vaccines um, and what they should do. So I felt I can provide some data here, some evidence. You know, we now talk about practicing evidence-based medicine. Uh, it was not a term when I was in school, but it's, uh, it's an important thing. It's, don't guess. Don't make it up. Don't go on the basis of anecdotes or feelings. What are the facts? What is known? And if it's not known, you should know that it's not known. And don't pretend that you do know something about it. Well, so I thought, I can provide this evidence. I took the first stuff with these graphs and the uh, uh, detailed description of uh, the, my definitions for the virus and how to interpret it. And I knew it's, it's boring, <laughs> it's difficult. But I packed it together in the first of a series of three papers because I knew you had to have that information. Otherwise, people were going to, scientists were just going to look at it and say, ah, yes, making it up, <laughs> wishful thinking. Um, so I documented it I, with a full, large set of references. and. Uh, and I thought that's a good first step. I moved on from that subject, having discussed and demonstrated uh, this, well, the, the name of the series was The Eradication of Poliomyelitis in the United States. I'm sorry, The Eradication of Poliovirus in the United States. Uh, and its subheading was Wild, and live poliovirus disease, live vaccine-associated poliovirus disease. So I described it, I discussed it, and, and provided people's comments about it um, that for many, many years. And then I decided, well, let's see what killed vaccine really does. What's really the experience with killed vaccine in the United States? It was used all by itself for 55 to 61, you know, for six years. They had good, good data collected. Lots of people studied it. The poliomyelitis, Alex Langmuir and the Poliomyelitis Surveillance Unit um, at what was then the National Center for Disease Control, the N NCDC, um, had this entire unit created in order to do surveillance. They collected all kinds of information. So I, I, I collected it. I knew what people said about why the live virus vaccine was supposed to be more effective, um, which I'll go into in just a second, I'll give you a a rough idea of what kinds of things those were. So I went to see what was known. 
live virus vaccine discussions happened in autumn, summer and autumn of 1961. The vaccine was brought back, uh, Sabin uh, brought it back from after doing a large number of mass campaigns. Uh, these were studies of use of vaccine in the field. They were not field trials, a controlled uh, study, well designed. The 1955 field trial for uh, kill polio virus vaccine, by the way, was just an incredible feat. Uh, Tommy Francis at the University of Michigan pulled it together, and it can never be done again. <laughs> we could never do a study like that now. It's a gold standard for uh, vaccine uh, trials. Well, despite the fact that they didn't have as much data, uh, when Saban came back, they was, they, he, he pushed to get it used in the United States. And I kind of looked at, okay, well, what, what were the reasons? Why did that happen? They were saying things like, it's administered orally. That's much easier to do than injection, and it's much better accepted by people. So we'll get better immunization rates. Um, it's a live vaccine, so um, it's going to give lifelong immunity. Everybody knows <laughs> that a live vaccine, live virus uh, infection, uh, would create a natural immunity, uh, which would be lifelong, whereas a non-infectious material, uh, you know, just wouldn't be as good. And uh, the, the, a kill vaccine it was less effective. We knew it had to be taken, and you had to have uh, four doses, and then you had to have a booster dose and all of that. And um, a live virus growing in your intestines would give you gut immunity. Everybody knows that vaccine, the virus, is spread by the fecal-oral route, uh, c contamination. And therefore, a vaccine given by injection did not stimulate intestinal immunity. It's a sp special antibody, IgA, as opposed to IgG. And so it couldn't possibly create a herd effect, and the live vaccine could. The live vaccine virus because it was excreted and passed to other people in the population, had the benefit of increasing the immunization rate. So people who had not come in and taken a sugar cube were still exposed, and the population would be better um, protected. So there were a number of things like that. And as I looked at the experience with killed virus vaccine, I, I realized, well, there's data here about <laughs> its effectiveness. There are data here about the uh, duration of immunity. Um, and it's long. And uh, there's data demonstrating that um, there is indeed a herd effect. Um, so I wondered why <laughs> that all that happened. Uh, because every one of the things that was mentioned as a reason, um, you know, turned out not to be demonstrable. There was no evidence for it. There was no evidence that the killed vaccine was failing in the ways that they said it had to because it was non-infectious. And the uh, things that the live vaccine was supposedly superior at, there'd never been any studies of it. It turns out these were all things that were being said and discussed and promoted uh, repeatedly uh, before there was either any vaccine available. And it came from what's, what is referred to as the Pasteurian dogma. Louis Pasteur 
believed that only an infection would induce immunity, that a chemical or a non-infectious uh, vaccination would not induce immunity anywhere nearly as well. I'll talk more about that later, but uh, that belief became so instilled uh, that by the 1920s, 1930s, it was general knowledge, everybody knew. It was in that time period when my father first wondered about it because he was in a medical school lecture and the professor, just similar to uh, the one that I, experience I had, said, you know, uh, you have to have an attenuated or a, an, inf an infection in order to develop immunity. And Jonas sat there and he thought, but we have diphtheria and tetanus, and these are toxoids. They're toxin, which has been modified so that it doesn't, it isn't toxic anymore, but it's similar enough that it creates immunity to the manifestation of the infection. And he said, so, you know, but it seems like it really can. <laughs> he developed a relationship with Tommy Francis, who was studying influenza virus, uh, and who believed that a uh, killed vaccine could work. And that's what started him on this whole process. So a lot of the, quote, controversy, the back and forth that happened around the 1940s and 1950s, and continued on after that and peaked in 1960 when there was this real uh, kind of challenge. Um, it was about the Pastorian dogma. It was beliefs and on one side and predictions and beliefs on, on the other side. And there was no information. And you have the loudest arguments when nobody has any information. <laughs> the beliefs are very strongly held, <laughs> and whether they turn out to be right or not, that's, <laughs> that's where people get quite vociferous. So uh, that carried forward, and that was going on at this 1961 discussion of bringing the live vaccine. Uh, into this country, and it was a very powerful, influential thing. I had looked at the actual experience in the United States, and uh, wondered what was the relative impact of the two diseases, uh, I'm sorry, the two vaccines. This is the entire experience back to 19, uh, early 1940s. You can see there was a, once it began and caught on, there began to be epidemics until the mid-50s, 1954, uh, was a devastating year. The killed vaccine was introduced in 1955. It was first used in the field trial in 54 among, uh, you know, uh, over a million children one and a half million. And there was this sharp decline, and you can see it's essentially mm -hmm. zero down there. The live vaccine wasn't introduced until here, where, as I mentioned before, on a log graph, it's stretched out at the bottom. This is a linear graph. So it, that means these are just straight numbers. They're not modified in any way. So uh, this is every one of these units is a set number of uh, cases. Well, I looked at the, uh, this looks like, who's really responsible for <laughs> uh, eliminating uh, poliovirus disease? What's, uh, how can the live vaccine people and the uh, policymakers say that uh, the live vaccine is preferred, and I'm now talking about out here, um, that it's, it's preferred because it is uh, responsible for the elimination of 
polio virus disease in the United States? Well, it certainly was being used when polio virus disappeared. But the impact of the killed vaccine was much more. Another way to look at this is to look at the amount of vaccines used. The dark lines here are the incidence of polio, cases of paralytic polio. And you can see from the average before uh, in 1950 through 1954, and the killed vaccine was, began to be used here, uh, the number of cases went down. Again, this is a linear scale, so it's not stretched out to ask questions about the kinetics. This is just, these are the numbers. This much, the pink area, is how much the accumulated number of doses of killed vaccine that had been administered. In other words, uh, just that's how much had been used uh, in the country that was associated with this decline. At this point, live vaccine became introduced, and this was the accumulated numbers by uh, 1968. Well, I looked at this, it's quite clear <laughs> that in terms of impact on virus in the community, uh, there was a heck of a lot more uh, impact from kill virus vaccine. And this is overlaid purpose intentionally because uh, the live virus vaccine initially was used in people who had already been vaccinated with killed vaccine. Um, so <laughs> there are reasons for looking at that and saying, I wonder why uh, the policies, I mean, look, this is just, these are just facts. I mean, I'm not trying to be biased here. Um, I just went to the literature to see what there was. And as I said, in this time period, the experience in the, in the, with killed virus vaccine in the United States, it was uh, demonstrated about the herd effect, duration of immunity. In fact, the rates of immunization went down when they switched from uh, an injected vaccine to an oral vaccine. No impact whatsoever in terms of uh, actual uh, immunization rates. So, you know, that, that was more of the stuff. I published this in the second uh, of the, that series of three papers, and I thought, this is important stuff. I, I'm really pleased to have pulled together evidence um, with many, many references on both sides and determined what was supported by the literature and what was based on a belief from 1930s, 1940s, I'm sorry, from the 19th century, <laughs> um, when Pastor first fought for it. I thought, this is going to be useful, <laughs> because it really will add something to the question of which vaccine should be used. Because it was apparent to me at this point that there were two vaccines that were both effective, one of them caused disease, and one of them didn't. One was, the risk was small, supposedly, with the live virus vaccine. Yeah, only one in every three million doses. So it was always disregarded as being you know, so small as to be irrelevant. But zero is a lot smaller than that. And in fact, Many people who were in the field uh, pointed out that that one in three million number was a little fishy because it was one case of vaccine-associated polio for every three million doses of vaccine distributed. This is what the manufacturers sent out. I don't know how much wasn't even used, 
you know, was thrown out because it went past its date, expiry date or whatever. Nobody knows. And so that makes it look smaller because you have more doses per case. And people were, children, infants were receiving multiple doses, three, four doses. Well, only one of those four doses uh, is given to a susceptible individual. They get immunized theoretically after the first dose. Okay, and if they didn't, they get immunized after the second dose. But after four doses, you have one individual protected. So that number, one in every three million doses of vaccine distributed, uh, is really not a measure of the risk of disease. It's a measure of the rate, a rate which is useful for following trends. You know, it's a number that you say, okay, as time went on, this is how the things changed or didn't change. But it didn't address what the risk was to a susceptible individual. That had been pointed out many times. I looked at it and said, well, primarily the people who are, uh, are uh, immunized are infants. That's where it's used. And there are only uh, three million of them born every year. So those are the number of vaccinated individuals. It's a much more accurate number. And the incidence of live poliovirus vaccine-associated disease is the effect, uh, the adverse effect that you're looking for, because that's, those are people who were susceptible. So the risk to a susceptible person and this is a risk to any one individual, is not one in every three million doses, but one in a million, which is uh, one in th roughly one in 300,000. Okay, that's a small number, but it's 100 times bigger <laughs> than the number that was being used as the risk. And that number was used by the drug companies, by the FDA, uh, by CDC. That was the standard that was used. As I said, people at CDC and elsewhere, you know, questioned it and pointed out that it really doesn't tell us anything about risk. But that's what was there. That's what people were told if they were told anything uh, when they got the vaccine. Um, actually, shortly after uh, I did that, calc that calculation myself. I just kind of made it up. Um, almost, an almost identical calculation was published by um, Neil Nathanson and his colleagues. Uh, and that, uh, they did the same kind of thing. They took the number of infants, the number of cases, and they came up with a number that was very similar. Basically, uh, um, uh, between uh, two and three cases per million vaccinated infants. I said it was three per million vaccinated infants. They were, you know, made a different set of assumptions, but it was the same order of magnitude and a lot less than uh, three, uh, one in every three million. People can't accept, understand, have a feeling for numbers like that because they're so big. I mean, even three in a million seems really big. But that's the only disease that was occurring from poliovirus in the United States. Um, it seemed to me that that should be information that was <laughs> used as was the case with uh, smallpox, uh, which actually was used for 20 years beyond the time that the risk was greater than the benefit because there was still a chance that the exposure to virus coming in. Um, I 
There were a number of things, other issues, uh, in 1961. It's really interesting to me when I first uh, found out about it or figured it out. Um, it was not just a question of the scientific uh, debate about uh, infectious or non-infectious, the Pasteur, Pasteurian dogma. Um, it was also, uh, that was, it was a very important one. Um, but uh, it wasn't the only one. In 1960, we were in the middle of the Cold War. And here was a product reportedly better than what we were using in the United States because it was talked up big by those who believed in it. Um, it was tested in Russia in large numbers of people. And it was part of the sales pitch, as it were. Um, we can't not have something that the Ruskies have. So that international politics <laughs> played a role. Um, a very important piece of the discussion at that time was a report that was made by the Council on Drugs of the AMA, American Medical Association. Uh, it was very influential. It was never actually published, but it was widely referred to and quoted. And it, in fact, is the source of the list of things. <laughs> That's where they were first pointed out, reasons that the live vaccine is, is better. And the AMA had never before made a policy statement about an unlicensed drug, an unlicensed product. This was not their place. They, they would report on efficacy or whatever of medicines that they were using, but this wasn't in use. They were advocating for something. Why were they doing that? I mean, it was an unusual thing for them to do. National politics. We had just had discussions, arguments, fights about Medicare. This is when Medicare was introduced. And the AMA, the physicians, had taken a very strong and public stance against it for all, you know, all their economic and uh, political reasons. Uh, and that's, that's fine. I mean, I, that doesn't bother me. It's a, it's a perspective. But they had gotten themselves a bad name <laughs> in the public. Medicare did go through, and you know they had to, they had to deal with it and stuff. So their their reputation had suffered as a result of that. And clearly, by not only jumping on but by creating this bandwagon, where the recommendation was, the plan was to bring in and the live vaccine, and do mass immunizations, and that would get rid of everything, would get rid of it all all at once. Well, it didn't turn out that way because the mass programs revealed the fact that <laughs> there were cases of vaccine-associated polio. Um, so scientific politics, international politics, uh, na uh, national, international, and scientific. And then, of course, there was Economics, as always, plays some role uh, because, well, the, the AMA was going to be able to have doctors in white coats out administering, giving doses of vaccine very publicly in large mass trials um, with, you know, giving, giving little kids sugar cubes and they can prove their image and thus the, their economic status. The vaccine manufacturers, they were perfectly happy 
the recommendation was that everybody who'd had killed vaccine needed to have live vaccine. They just doubled <laughs> uh, the size of their market. Um, I, and I'm not pointing out any one of these things as something that was necessarily decided and a cabal in the back room kind of thing. But these were factors uh, that, that uh, all went together. So realizing that I had information that this was a period of time in the late 70s when the issue was being addressed again. 1977, the Institute of Medicine, which is a very prestigious organization, did a very large um, conference and discussion, evaluation of the two poliovirus vaccines. So that kind of thing was going on. The ACIP, the American uh, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, uh, the Red Book of the um, Pediatric uh, Association, those, they were all looking at the question. So I had information that would hopefully be helpful in these considerations. And as I said at the beginning, it's a new generation. You know, maybe the people who made the policies you know, a little while ago, you know, 15, 20 years ago, would still have strong feelings, but the rest of the uh, scientific and medical community would be open to it. Um, and so I wrote a third paper in that series, which was called uh, Eradication of Poliomyelitis eradication of poliovirus. I make the distinction because poliomyelitis is a disease. And you certainly want to get rid of all the disease, but eradication of the agent, the virus, is different from uh, uh, elimination. So the uh, eradication of poliovirus in the United States, practical considerations. And this, of the three papers, unlike the first one, which is uh, full of numbers and you know, laboratory science, uh, the second one is nice and, and wholesome, but still got meaty things in it. This paper was just addressing the question. Let's compare one with the other. Practical purposes. What's the story? What's going on? And as you probably <laughs> can guess uh, from everything that I'd seen uh, up to that point, uh, and this was personal research in the literature, um, you know, direct. <laughs> um, these three papers have a huge number of references in them. The publisher s said to me, said, you know, can't you just make this one paper, you know, kind of squeeze it up, and get rid of some of those references? I said, no, I'm sorry, I can't, <laughs> because people are going to look at me and see my name, and they're going to assume that I'm biased. And I said, I'm not. <laughs> I questioned Jonas as much as, <laughs> if not more, uh, than a lot of people in raising these issues. Um, So I wanted to make sure that there was a good, solid scientific foundation. In the meantime, the Institute of Medicine, in doing their analysis, came to the conclusion either vaccine could be used effectively to control polio. They were equivalent. They used that word equally effective, uh, that, you know, after making all the comparisons, okay? The only difference between the two uh, vaccines was the fact that live poliovirus vaccine could spread immunity, 
could move out into the population from a vaccinated person and, uh, you know, get better immunization rates. Well, that had never actually been demonstrated. No study had ever been done on the actual impact of a spread effect. We had documented evidence, measurements of a herd effect in the killed vaccine. But let me explain. A herd effect is uh, that when a portion of a population, a herd, is uh, vaccinated or immune, they will not pass the virus, the disease agent around, so that those who are susceptible have a lower risk of exposure. So the herd effect actually is very specifically when actual number of, of, of uh, cases in uh, 1950 to 54, based on this, one would have expected this much expected if there had been no vaccine. So that's without any vaccine effect. If the vaccine effect was restricted to those who were received the vaccine, that's what this orange color is here at this second level. That's what one can calculate in, in a reasonable way um, that would be expected if only vaccinees were protected. What was observed was this little short pink bar down here that was actually observed and measured. That is a herd effect. There was a reduction of disease in susceptible individuals. A herd effect is not spread of immunity. Uh, that's often mixed up and confused uh, and used interchangeably by people who should know better. But the Institute of Medicine made this determination without actually any measurements of it. And basically promoting a policy whereby people were being immunized without their knowledge with an unapproved virus, one that would not pass the safety tests of the original vaccine. So uh, this wasn't spread of immunity. I mean, I, I thought a more appropriate term was involuntary vaccination with a less safe product. I, I mean, that's inherent in <laughs> saying, I want to give this to children so that others who haven't been vaccinated will benefit from it. When you say unsafe, what do you mean? What level of safety are we talking about? Oh, the the uh, requirements, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but basically the requirements when a batch of vaccine uh, virus is produced, um, it has to be demonstrated that its level of virulence or its ability to cause disease is sufficiently low. Okay? Whatever that level is, by the measure, if it comes in at this level, it's not allowed to be released. It fails the safety test. Um, and so, so that's sort of an arbitrary <laughs> level, but there was a safety test to do that. Uh, and it was well known that the virus that passed through the human intestinal tract would not pass that test, in spite of the fact that it may have been low originally up on the sugar cube, by the time it got to the other end of the alimentary tract, uh, the virus will have gained back some of its virulence. So that's why I say, by definition in a sense, if it would not pass the safety test, <laughs> then it must be unsafe, okay, arbitrary. 
but we know it was associated with illness as well. So from that perspective, just a practical perspective, it was unsafe. But what I meant when I was referring to this was specifically the safety tests that allow for vaccine to be released and used. And the policy of spreading immunization is essentially a policy of using a vaccine that would not pass the safety test. I wondered how they could do that <laughs> and sleep at night. Um, th this was actually pointed out in 1961 when the discussions were going on. And I'm sorry, 1959, uh, uh, Dick and Dale in England pointed out that not since Lady Mary Montague had introduced the practice of variolation to England from European continent um, in the 18th century. It was a while ago. Um, we had never used, since then, a vaccine, an agent that would spread in the population. The reason variolation was not uh, used was because it was simply taking smallpox virus from, uh, from a sick individual and giving smallpox because they knew that if, if you survived a smallpox infection, you would be immune. Jenner is the person who made the observation and realized that cowpox virus which is called vaccinia, as opposed to variola, had enough cross-reactivity that milkmaids who got cowpox never got smallpox. And that's what led to the beginning of vaccination, vaca meaning cow. <laughs> um, so, and he was not the only ones. In, in, in uh, 1961, many people argued, we shouldn't be put using something that spreads. We have no control over. But those voices were buried by the constant refrain of uh, you know, those who believe the Pastorian dogma. Um, The other thing, another thing that happened in the uh, 1961 was that several people, Alex Langmuir had pointed out a couple of years before, said, we've got this problem licked. <laughs> you know, this is, we know how to apply it. We know where to do it. We know how to get to, we know that we need to get susceptible people immunized, vaccinated. And that by properly applying it, we'll, we will succeed. And this was like 1958, I think. And at 1961 discussions, uh, David Bodian, who was another very well-known polio researcher, said, you know, it's a real question as to whether polio is even a public health problem anymore. Why are we going to be using mass immunizations, mass campaigns, to solve a problem that isn't there with an agent that spreads? Uh, you know, these were great questions. So I had put all of this together in practical considerations. It was a much simpler, uh, simpler thing, and I thought, okay, this will be useful or will help the discussions. Um, it provides references. Anybody can check uh, to see, you know, what's, where it comes from. And I was surprised that I didn't get any feedback about it. <laughs> One friend at CDC told me about it. He, he read it and somebody else at CDC <laughs> congratulated me on 
on this graph, <laughs> she liked it so much, she said, no, that tells the whole story. But I was denigrated only. <laughs> the publisher, who'd been very supportive of me, went to John Fox to write a commentary that went with my uh, pu first publication. I saw it before publication, and I was just astounded because it was full of stuff that wasn't information that wasn't supported. John Fox was at that po this, at that point in time one of the old guard. He'd been doing uh, polio research since <laughs> late late forties, and he just discounted this and discounted that and says, oh, we all know, and it sounded very impressive, and people who didn't know the details uh, were just impressed by that, and, and of course, you know, the guy's name is Salk, he's biased. Mm. <laughs> I, the publisher didn't want me to write a response. Um, as I asked him, you know, can I write a response to that to get published at the same time? He said, no, we can't do it. You'll have plenty of time to comment later when the letters come in to the editor. You'll get to respond to those. I said, oh, okay. I then went to John Fox. He was at the University of Washington, where I was, and I met with him. And so he's, you know, uh, I'm, I'm relatively a student <laughs> at that point, and he's a you know senior professor. And we talked about it. I asked him, you know, what what did you, you know, why did you think this? And he gave me some generalities again. He said, you know, there's just no information. I said, well, wh what specifically did you find wrong with Gabe Stickle's article on the herd effect? That picture I showed you a minute ago was what Gabe Stickle had done the analysis. I said, you know, what, you, know, be, you know, I'm interested. What specifically is wrong with that analysis? And he said, well, I didn't actually read it. I, I, was, I, I was speechless for a moment. Um, and we finished the conversation shortly after that. But he had said a number of things that were um, inaccurate some things that were rude. <laughs> um, and I, I, it was hard for me to believe that a teacher, a professor, would make a comment or something. I understand where it came from. He knew it all. He brought it all with him. He'd been through this discussion before, and he merely had the same discussion over again without actually looking at the data or the references that I'd pulled together. Okay. He's old guard. He's carried baggage with him. So I waited for my opportunity to respond because I knew I needed to respond to specific points in that in order to make it clear to the readers uh, that you know what, what what the truth was, and I was quite disappointed when I found out. That the next, that the next issue of reviews in infectious diseases that had come out, and there were not a large number, but there were several, three, four letters, and the publisher had John Fox respond to them. Excuse me, who? <laughs> what am I? <laughs> you know, chop liver? Um, I, I, I did not understand because he had promised me, and it made no sense for somebody who was not the author to respond to questions about the articles. I, it was then that I began to understand some of my father's feelings about what he had gone through. Um, I continued to do research. I, I did wrote papers, some with him, some on my own, with, uh, about vaccinology of poliomyelitis. We refined the definition uh, and uh, herd effect, because that was a weak spot, in a sense, in, in the discussion I had had. And I had more information. I had lots of stuff. So I did a very specific study and presented that in Beethoven 
in the Netherlands, um, and other things. And nothing happened. <laughs> they were never referenced in the literature. This is something Jonas had told me. It happened to him. He said, you know, well, they just, you know, didn't like what he said, so they ignored it and didn't even, you know, put in a reference that I disagree strongly with. It just disappeared. I mean, like, that's my, my all of my publications have, in a sense, just disappeared uh, from uh, the discussion because without being referenced, somebody has to actually go back to the library at 1980 and, you know, stumble across it or look for it. You know, things that are referenced in other <laughs> things, you know, it expands and you can track things back down. So I really began to understand at that point why Jonas had pulled out, backed off in 1961. He put up with so much of these non-arguments uh, and couldn't get anybody to listen. I was now having that experience myself. And I was, I was losing the optimism I had on the boardwalk in Atlantic City. There isn't a new generation, or if there is, it's not paying attention the way I expected it to. Um, so that, that was really you know, disappointment for me because I've tried all of the proper channels uh, to get across the materials that I had pulled together and, and, and realized were useful. And it was just made no difference. What did I do then? <laughs> I had been approached several times about acting as an expert witness uh, in cases of uh, vaccine-associated polio. I wouldn't do it. I was a pediatrician. <laughs> I didn't want to go say a pediatrician had done something bad by giving this vaccine that he's not given any choice about. You know, and with, because what, there's, what he's told by the manufacturers is not accurate. <laughs> um, and at the, at the point where I got to, I got to a point where I said, you know, darn it all, I can't seem to make a change or an effect. At least maybe I can help one or two people <laughs> who have been injured. So I started doing being an expert witness. And essentially, my message was always about the, uh, the manufacturer and the stuff that they said. Their response is, but that's what the government tells us to say. And the government policymakers who, were, who set this policy and did it, you know, that's, that was where impact needed to be made. And, uh, I, the cases that I testified in and, and others um, were becoming very successful from the <laughs> lawyer's perspective. Uh, they were making, good, they were getting good settlements, um, including uh, an award of a $10 million award in Kansas, $2 million of damages and $8 million <laughs> of punitive. This was <laughs> unheard of at the time. And somehow the manufacturer managed to convince the Supreme Court of Kansas that to reverse it. This poor guy died before this was even all over, uh, who'd gotten polio from his daughter, Emil Johnson. So every one of these people had a name. I got to see them. I got to meet them. I hear their stories. There is a wonderful article in uh, Los Angeles Times uh, from sometime in the 1980s, I forget exactly when, 
But it was right at the time that I was doing this, and the article made the point, in order to, you know, it's not nice to have to sue people and stuff, but in order to make change, that's what you have to do sometimes. In the meantime, we're getting compensation, some kind of compensation to the people who are injured. From my perspective, I was feeling like, okay, I can't change the policy. At least I can try to put pressure somewhere. When you hit somebody in the pocketbook, they tend to go and think about it again. <laughs> I hadn't realized it until uh, years later when somebody told me that he had heard a conversation by, by the uh, insiders at Letterly, which was the only manufacturer at that time, um, referring to me as, you know, public enemy number one. <laughs> oh, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, I, I, I didn't like doing it. You know, it was not like it was fun or anything, and sometimes the doctors were included on the case, and I tried very much to make the point. You know, Dr. So-and-so was doing what is common practice, what is everybody does. An attorney asked me in one case, well, have you, you're a pediatrician, have you ever given the oral polio vaccine? I said, well, I don't administer it myself, but I write orders for the nurses to do that. Um, and, you know, do you give, you know, specific warnings about it? Um, and, and besides the fact, there's no killed vaccine available as an alternative. I said, well, I didn't routinely give warnings because that was not general practice, accepted practice of medicine at that point, except on one occasion. I was very comfortable with the hippie type patients. <laughs> A lot of patients that I were uncomfortable with, and many of my resident you know, fellows were not so comfortable dealing with a, a hippie type. Young parents came in with a child, uh, and they said, you know, well, we're not going to get vaccinations. This was a long time ago, well before <laughs> the vaccine deniers or whatever at this point. And I said, you know, OK, that's your decision. You know, I said, I can understand that. Uh, they're being natural, and it was not that great a risk, except I pointed out to them, I said, but if your baby is not vaccinated, then he will be at high risk from getting vaccine virus disease from one of his buddies. I said, you know, I can't you know, push you, I can't say terribly much about diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, okay? But I can understand why one is questioning it, especially because you're not aware that it's around and having problems. But I said, live poliovirus vaccine disease is around. It's in every daycare center. It's in every kindergarten. Uh, it's in every babysitter's setting. So I, I just explained that to them they got the vaccine. I said, you know, it's got risks associated with it. The con <laughs> a recipient can get disease. I said, unfortunately, we don't have an alternative right now. It's only available in Canada. <laughs> the closest thing that's available is Canada, and they don't supply it for us. But I said, you know, you can reduce the risk by giving your child the, vac the oral vaccine rather than having your child get that vaccine virus from somebody else. And she said, oh, <laughs> OK, I understand, she said. <laughs> um, I told the story you know, to the attorney. I don't think that was what he was looking for. <laughs> he was trying to catch me up with, well, you do this. You know, what's... And you know, the only time I made a big point out of it was to make somebody take the vaccine because otherwise it was too dangerous. <laughs> Interesting. So how, how did the discussion start to change? 
Or there are factors like that, and were there other factors that you think started to change people's minds? Uh, yeah, that made people sit up and listen. And the uh, swine flu experience, and people, at that point in time, people were becoming bothered about DPT uh, and the reactions to it. Um, and uh, Autism Association, all, all of that story was beginning then. It all followed one lawsuit in the early 1970s, Reyes versus Wyeth. It was a live vaccine case, live virus case in Texas. Uh, you know, I, I actually at this point don't even remember whether you know, who won? <laughs> but that was a turning point because that's when people realized, oh, vaccine injury is something <laughs> that exists. You know, you can, either, you can get a settlement or whatever. And that live poliovirus vaccine is really the beginning <laughs> of that whole process of um, litigation as affecting it, which was driving manufacturers, driving manufacturers out of business. I mean, they dropped the business. There was only one uh, left by that time. And going back to Dick and Dane in England, back in, the, in 1958, they said, you know, Lady Mary Montague, and this is very elation, it's different from uh, yellow fever or anything else because uh, this virus is known to be ex to move, to spread in the population. He said, and you know, if there's just one occurrence of that, it will have a major impact on vaccination programs everywhere. So that was 20 years, <laughs> uh, 25 years before this time period. So there were people then who were <laughs> on board, who understood, who, who saw, the same, saw the same things. Eventually, I backed out of the lawsuit business as well. It wasn't a business, but <laughs> the um, testifying, um, because uh, to a great extent because cases were settling instead of going to trial. And um, I pretty much moved on in directions of other things. As I said before, I had continued to publish polio. I was also doing research in the pathology department on biology of aging and cell culture and all kinds of other things. Uh, and I left the university and went into biotech. Um, so I was doing other things. Uh, but it, I still published, every once in a while, something when it was appropriate, I including, including one that demonstrated the single-dose effectiveness of the new vaccine. If you give one dose after the age of six months, it's effective. Don't remember the numbers, you know, 99 plus percent effective. Of the killed virus. Of the killed virus vaccine. Uh, it was the one that potency had been standardized and was new manufacturing techniques that allowed it to be made less, less expensively. So I, I, <laughs> I wrote that, that was, uh, that was important. Involved a little bit with some studies in Africa on practical ways of getting vaccine uh, because uh, it was thought that, A, it's too expensive. You gotta train people to give injections rather than just, you know, drops. Um, and, you know, you needed to maintain frozen material. Um, and so, for all kinds of reasons, it was not used. The live vaccine was always being promoted. And uh, it turns out that in the underdeveloped countries, or countries with warm climates, the vaccine virus, it's not very effective. They were having to give four, five, eight, 
10 doses before somebody would finally convert. There was too much competition with other intestinal pathogens. Um, and so they switched from just giving individual ones to doing mass administrations every, whatever, certain number of years. You know, every year, every two years, they would come in and immunize the entire population. That's how we have to do this. Well, when you do that, um, it seems to me that you end up spending darn near <laughs> what it would cost for one dose of killed vaccine that would be effective. I mean, that study was done in Africa. Uh, yes, it has to be maintained frozen. Live vaccine has to be maintained at refrigerator temperature, which is easier to do. <laughs> Practically speaking, it's not hard to keep something on ice. It's done all the time. And, but it is hard with lack of power and stuff and transport to maintain um, or quote, refrigerator temperature. So, you know, I was involved in saying, pointing out some of these things as well. And this was the practical part of vaccinology. We initially defined vaccinology as needing to understand the pathogen, uh, the clinical aspects, the disease, uh, the vaccination material that you're using, and so forth, in order to get effective immunization. So vaccinology was studying and dealing with the vaccines to make them more effective. And it was 19, early 1980, 84, I think it was. Um, Jonas and I wrote a paper called Vaccinology of Poliomyelitis. And at that point, defined vaccinology as not only all that stuff, but the aspect of practical vaccinology. How do you get two people? How do you get it administered? How do you deal with cultural problems locally? <laughs> uh, all of the side issues, as it were, of actually ending up with an immunized child. Because um, I felt it was really important that that aspect was needed to be part of vaccinology. Not theoretical, not technical, but practical because the whole objective of vaccinology is to ha get effective immunization. If we can't get the vaccine to somebody, it ain't gonna work. Um, so I had been doing some of those things along the way as well. And in a sense, my final, I had moved from being very optimistic to experiencing <laughs> Why, what's going on here, to beginning to understand what's going on here is not really logical. It, it's clearly emotional, which I had denied before. In medical school, I went to talk with David Carver, who was a virologist. I worked in his laboratory studying for a while. And one day, I said to him, I, I'd be interested in chatting with you sometime about the you know, poliovirus vaccines. He said, no, 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 no. Don't want to, you know, vaccines are too emotional. And I thought to myself, I mean, I, I backed off. I didn't say anything because he was, he was clear. He didn't want to talk about it. Um, but I said to myself, what's emotional about data? <laughs> That's what I was going to talk to him about. <laughs> what's emotional about facts, information? Well, I realized that the, quote, problem, the issue, was more on the emotional end of the spectrum, more on the personal end of the spectrum, more on the letting go of one idea and moving on to another, sociological, psychological, aspects that I just didn't know how to deal with. Um, and, you know, I think it would make a fascinating study, 
and I'm sure there are people that study that kind of thing. But to me, it just meant, you know, no need to do that. Until I got a call from the American Journal of Public Health about a paper that had been written by somebody at CDC, a group of CDC people, um, which used a decision, decision analysis methodology um, to address the issue of what would be the risk if we stopped if we stopped using live vaccine and used only killed vaccine because it was being discussed and I had problems with some of the technical issues I thought it was misapplied the technique yeah, okay, one can argue about all these kinds of things, but I, you know, I had what I thought were valid questions about it, um, and and I put that into my uh, response, my article. But the thing that I really bothered me was that there, oh, and I'm sorry, the result of it was, oh, we should never do that, <laughs> because the risk would be so great. <laughs> you know, uh, four out of the six decision panelists who were consulted on this were people who were long-standing <laughs> uh, live virus vaccine advocates. Uh, so I mean, that was biased to some extent, but they used it to end up with a specific recommendation about a policy. And in my opinion, it was not an appropriate use of that statistical analysis. And that wasn't really the important question. The important question was how policy had been developed. How can you be having a policy of involuntary vaccination in the United States of America with a product that is known to be dangerous? when there is an alternative. And I said, I said something about, you know, that's what, I, I was disappointed that that kind of discussion, those issues weren't, you know, brought up in the a discussion of policy, polio immunization policy. Um, and I, the name of my, the title of the article was, uh, poliomyelitis, a, a new challenge for a new generation. I just realized by that time that the group I thought previously was a new generation was merely an intermediate <laughs> generation. Um, and whatever was going to happen was still, was yet, was yet to come. So that's what I, I ended up, in a sense, my polio career by saying, people, we should somehow address how policies are made. Where do you get off <laughs> making these kinds of decisions for people? It, somehow it doesn't, seem, it doesn't seem right. And whenever I talk to people who are getting vaccines, you know, lay people, they get it immediately. Juries, ordinary people, not experts of any kind, they understood. Um, so that's what we should be talking about. How do we set policy? The authors responded to my technical questions, which is per perfectly appropriate, saying, well, we think it's valid for this reason or that reason, okay? That's ordinary back and forth science. He said, we never intended to discuss social or legal issues. That wasn't part of our study. So, you know, that's the end of that. My point was, I think it should be part of a study making a recommendation for policy. So I kind of left it at, I, I can't make any policy change <laughs> and I don't understand how to do it. I don't understand exactly why things go the way they do. Uh, but I, I guess I'm, I'm going to do some other things instead. It was 
just frustrating, wasn't going anywhere. At that point, you asked when things started to change. And gradually, after that, uh, things began to change. The WHO uh, organized the eradication, global eradication program. <laughs> never recognize, it's never recognizing anything about where that came from or what the difficulties were for the you know, 20 years uh, between that. Um, Jonas used to say something which I thought was amusing until I realized he was speaking from experience and I was watching it happen. He said, you know, if you do something, first they tell you it's not possible. Then they say, well, maybe it's possible, but it's not important. And then they say, I knew it all along. <laughs> and that's what I've been watching <laughs> for the last 10 years or so, was many of the things that we, we had said coming back around again. Right here at Emory, there's a vaccinology program. <laughs> uh, that term is now constantly used. I'm not even sure how they define it. Um, and I, I sat in at a conference the other day where they're talking about vaccines and was just amazed at the number of things that Jonas has had on his agenda. In the 1950s, he was going to, after the polio vaccine project, his intention was to go and look at adjuvants, which are things that are added to vaccines in order to increase the response to them. And it was a touchy subject at the time, 1958, and because, you know, people didn't you know, believe it and, you know, we, how are we going to know what, you know, so you give mineral oil to people as an adjuvant or Freund's adjuvant, which got a bacille, BCG in it. Uh, but he had had experience with influenza demonstrating how much higher response it was with the adjuvant. So he was wanted to explore it. He didn't get a chance to because he was so distracted by all the brouhaha uh, that went on. And um, I haven't got a bad rap for that, but anyway, uh, that's... <laughs> That's not science. Um, so he was unable to do that. That's now a top <laughs> topic in vaccinology now is evaluation of uh, adjuvants. After he was do had been doing the polio studies, he started doing cancer vaccines. Melanoma patients, I don't remember what it was exactly, but he would give them back some of their own melanoma cells or something. And he would have slideshows at night as he would show these amazing changes before and after. Okay, it wasn't necessarily long term, and, you know, but he was exploring immunology of what was going on. Jonas was a virologist initially. And in the mid-50s, he started referring to himself as an immunologist. He said, you know, I'm not just a virologist. I, mean, I pay attention to the immune system and how it works. That wasn't a typical term <laughs> in those days. Uh, Burnett had proposed all about the immune system and everything, but it had not caught on anywhere, and so it wasn't an actual field of study. Um, and now it's routine. Uh, so it's been, it was fascinating for me to watch that change, that development, um, and to come to a meeting now, today, having been out of it for a long time, and frankly, hearing exactly the same arguments made <laughs> about live and killed poliovirus vaccines that came from the
pre-vaccine era. I told you I would come back to Pasteur, the Pasteurian dogma. In, uh, when was it, 1980s, 1990s, um, Gerald Giesen uh, published a book. He had spent years studying the private papers of Louis Pasteur, the laboratory notebooks, which had just then you know, finally been released by the family. And I learned a lot uh, through here. You know, Pasteur's personality, uh, how driven he was. Um, he said he appreciated criticism, but he would blow up. <laughs> um, and his belief in the uh, dogma, infectious versus non-infectious, um, immunization. And what he talked about in here a lot was the um, taking away of the myth, <laughs> you know, reducing the myth of Pasteur. He's not the first. That's, that point has been made, you know, over since early, you know, 20s, 40s, or whatever. You know, there are people, who, historians who do that kind of research, uh, said, you know, you know, he probably wasn't. He didn't. He wasn't the way everybody <laughs> imagined him. This great, wonderful, glorious uh, hero doesn't. Surprise me that that happened, okay? I mean, I'm not, certainly not blaming <laughs> Pasteur for it, although he did make as much of it as he could um, and promoted himself quite a bit. But what was amazing to me was to discover in reading this that he really pushed hard on only infectious agents could cause, could induce immunity. Over and over, he stood by that incredibly strongly in public. He was trying to develop a non-infectious rabies vaccine. Or discussed it a lot. His attitude had obviously changed in some way. It was like he didn't necessarily still believe what he'd said before, but he kept saying what he'd said before. And the real surprise was the secret of puy la Fort, which was the little village in which he first demonstrated Xanthrax vaccine. It was a big, impressive thing. Inoculated some sheep with anthrax vaccine, then gave anthrax to your clinical disease, to another set of sheep, and mix, mix them together. And the ones who were vaccinated survived, and the other ones didn't. And this established an important principle that vaccines can work. It turns out that he did not use, at puy la Fort the attenuated live virus infectious vaccine that he was working on. He used the non-infectious, chemically derived, killed vaccine that was being worked on by someone else in his lab, Emile Roux. So I, I came across this after, <laughs> um, after my dad had died, and I was really <laughs> sorry because for him, while the vaccine itself, the product, was important, and you know, he was pleased and proud of what his contribution was toward uh, you know, reducing the incidence of disease, saving children's lives, etc. You know, all of that part, all of that stuff was great. But what drove him from the very beginning was the principle. He wanted to prove 
the principal. And it was frustrating because nobody would hear it. He did. He proved it in spades. And it turns out that the Pasteurian dogma didn't really exist. The people who were repeating the Pasteurian dogma were carrying forward something that was mm, deceitful at some level. <laughs> um, how ironic that was. You know, he, he did not um, move away from science for just a little bit and I put on my son of hat. Um, I remember as a child um, seeing what happened at um, the University of Michigan when the 19, April 12, 1955 announcement was made. I, you know, I was, a, I was a little kid. I loved seeing the displays and everything's going on. I didn't really follow what people were talking about, and certainly not in his presentation or what I was pleased that he was up there. And, you know, we were all pleased that people seemed excited, okay? Um, but Jonas didn't really understand what Ed Murrow said to him in a, uh, in a meeting, a TV show, hear it now, or see it now. I ran live from Racket Hall. He looked at me and said, young man, a great tragedy has befallen you. You have lost your anonymity. Whoa. <laughs> he had no idea what that meant at the time. Oh, really? The glorification of Jonas Salk that happened was distressful to him. He could not get back to the laboratory to do stuff. And he was accused by his peers of encouraging it, uh, wanting to be in the limelight, spotlight, um, of saying things like during his presentation at, the, um, at that meeting, uh, he talked about uh, making a vaccine better. We can make one that's 100% effective, okay? He was talking about theoretical principle issues. He wasn't bragging. <laughs> he was talking about the principle that he wanted to make. And something else happened during that talk, which was that he failed to recognize and here are the people in this laboratory. This is a dumb mistake, <laughs> okay? Uh, no excuse for it, okay? But I do know that he was focused on, what am I gonna say? I have to prepare a speech. I don't know the results of this trial yet. I'm pretty sure it's gonna be some effect, but what if it's only, you know, 40% effective? So he was really focusing on that. Um, my mother said at that time, she said, you know, I didn't see his talk ahead of time. I didn't see the draft. She said, I wish I had, because I would have pointed that out to him, that he was missing that. So his, you know, his own personnel were disappointed to some extent. Some of them, you know, were fairly embittered by that. I get it. You know, it's insulting, et cetera. It's, so one time you get somebody to say, thanks, you know, what a contribution. But he also didn't recognize any scientists on whose work he had built. Okay, well, this is against, you know, science, scientific uh, ethics. This great big media circus, which in fact was put on by the uh, March of Dimes, he had nothing to do with it. I mean, he was bothered by all of this stuff being done. Uh, he got dinged by his peers for that as well. So his peers, he never got what he really wanted, which was recognition that the principle he espoused was good, that he did 
good work as a scientist, you know, just ordinary things <laughs> that happen in science. And that day, April 12, 1955, it changed. Not only did he do these terrible things with media and being friendly to people, being nice to people, he, he, he didn't know what the heck to do. And people would come up to him and want to touch him and shake his hand and, and you know, crowd around him. I mean, he couldn't walk down the street without that happening. It took a long time for him to you know, learn how to be this and do this. But he was just being polite. <laughs> he wasn't trying to encourage or grab the spotlight or, you know, build on the fame or something like that. He was just being polite to people. What, what, what else could he do? Go away, don't bother me? <laughs> he would never have done that, <laughs> you know. So there are lots of pictures of him smiling and talking to people and shaking hands and letting people touch him and, you know, the whole, the whole thing. Um, but except for the fact that he was a nice guy, uh, he got a bad rap from his peers on all of that. I mean, it still appears, I mean, it, it's been the focus of several books. Um, not the first one. Breakthrough was really very good, very balanced. But a after that, it was like people needed to find something that they could sell, that they could make. And so the controversy was built up, and Jonas Salk's uh, tearing down of Jonas Salk or revealing Jonas Salk's, you know, bad side or something was something you should get their fingers on. Um, so that. That went on, and you know, his friends knew this. <laughs> um, the people who you know who really knew him, and it, it just it hurt hurt me in a sense to see the negative impact it all had on him. He didn't get back to the laboratory. He moved on to something different. He moved on to the institute, creating this institute. He has not gotten credit for the real contributions that he has made. Um, the principal, you know, the techniques and technologies that he developed while working on polio, I was amazed to read in a, a publication, one of his early publications, that they created out of plexiglass a 96 well plate, which is research. Now it's Always you. I mean, it's in lots of places. Cause there are 96 little wells. You can put a little stuff in each one. And I was astounded to see in this publication that he said, why don't we do this? You know, that. And there were other technological things that, you know, he, uh, he, he created. Um, and in fact, his, I was surprised when I actually started reading his papers. He did good work. I mean, he, he was careful. He would then make a intuitive leap. This means that maybe such and such. And his peers, who already started out not being comfortable with what he was doing, you know, said, ah, he's just, you know, wishful thinking. He makes these jumps. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You can't conclude that from... What's happened here? Well, he would take that criticism and go back to the laboratory and then would publish a paper filling in all of the gaps, showing that, in fact, he was right. And it, you could fill in the gaps. He would just leap to a conclusion, which has helped him, you know, go other ways. <laughs> I saw those papers, and I saw that every single time he responded but that never changed what the reaction had been. Um, and this business of losing your anonymity was not a small thing. That had huge impacts, well, on all of us to some extent, but you know, it, it changed his career. Um, to some extent, he, he 
because of the lack of recognition for the science among his peers, etc., and the disdain with which he was held, Albert Sadem called referred to the polio project as kitchen science. I'll comment on that again in a minute, but. Um, He got to the point where he, he began to realize that the fame opened doors for him. It was a kind of political capital that would get him to be able to do things um, for people, with people. And I'm totally aware of it because when he died, poof, <laughs> it went away, uh, you know. But, Peter and Jonathan and I were suddenly out there <laughs> with nothing. I, I felt like I'd lost my mouthpiece because I would talk with him about science or something, AIDS, whatever he was working on, and give him ideas, or raise questions and stuff. And he would go off and mouth it to somebody else where it was important to use. And nobody listened to me <laughs> anymore. Albert Sabin was very much like Louis Pasteur in his personality, which I discovered by reading <laughs> this book and what Louis Pasteur was like. Um, he was a self-promoter. Uh, he was an orator, which is comment about, uh, about Louis Pasteur. And I saw him many times. He would stand up and make a presentation like this. and and be very convincing and insistent and stuff, and disparaging, of a, literally disparaging of other people and stuff. Nah, 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 nah. And, I mean, I'm perfectly comfortable saying that now because I'm not just, you know, oh, what a nasty guy, he didn't like my father. You know, I observed him, I, I saw him. And most interestingly, after my father died, I went to a meeting in his place. Somebody they asked me to please come. I said, I don't want to come all the way to France. I said, it was for Charles Mary, a meeting that he was putting together. And they were very good friends. He was very important. I said, OK, I will do it <laughs> to be supportive of Charles. At this conference, which was about the 100th anniversary of Pastor or something in the 150th of Jenner's. You know. um, there were a number of people who were recognized, you know, and with little plaques or something for their work and contribution and to vac vaccine development. It was to be my father and Hillary Kaprowski and, and uh, Maurice Hilleman. No. Oh. Anyway, these, these were much older than me uh, and very uh, respected and very strong advocates for live poliovirus vaccine. I mean, they were in, the, they were in Sabin's quote, group, and Sabin's wife was also there, and I stood in for my dad. And they're standing around and having a conversation, and these two or three guys who had worked with him, grown up with him. They laughed. Some, I mean, something about, you know, well, he was not, not always the nicest person. And the other one said, yeah, even his best friends didn't like him. <laughs> I thought, I don't think you wanted me to be standing here <laughs> you know, to, to hear that. But it was such a wonderful and succinct uh, picture of what I had seen. Um, he was a good scientist and all of that. But to ding my father for doing kitchen science? What's wrong with kitchen science? The kitchen is where everything starts. You get new ideas and breakthroughs by using what you already have or applying them in a different way for a different purpose. Implied that there was something bad about it, that it was... You know, it was denigrating. It was, don't know what you're doing. It's just unimportant. 
Maybe it's true, but it's not <laughs> not important. But Sabin's this reference to kitchen science surprised me because the work that Sabin was doing was culturing polio viruses and passing them through tissue culture. I know how to do that. <laughs> Repeatedly until uh, nature made the virus weaker. Important stuff. But he was essentially following a recipe out of Pasteur's cookbook. This is exactly what Louis Pasteur was doing. So uh, that, <laughs> that didn't sit well with me that um, somebody would try to make a point like that. Jonas got dinged for wanting to, for not giving credit. I absolutely agree that that happened in, uh, uh, at the Racken Hall. April 12, 1955. I don't apologize for it, but I, I think I have an explanation for it. But he got along so well with his uh, subordinates. He gave people credit just being there all the time. I saw, I've seen him uh, be approached by one of the maintenance workers who got into a conversation with him about the cousin he had told him about before who was ill and how, what should he do about it? Or, you know, I remember last week when I talked to him, I said, oh, I know, Jonas would say, you know, how is your foot? <laughs> and the, they were very loyal to him. This, this is the nice guy reference I made. Um, and he really respected them and appreciated the loyalty and stuff. He wasn't the world's best expressor <laughs> of that kind of thing. But the, the degree of loyalty that we saw. Uh, we went to the extent of adding a dedication at the University uh, San Diego Library. My brothers and I donated his papers. It's an incredible collection, <laughs> another major contribution. <laughs> He saved everything, and Lorraine Friedman organized it. His secretary. <laughs> yeah, long-time secretary, right from back in 1949 or something. And she went out to California with him, and she was very, very careful. Everything was filed, everything is beautiful, and the librarian saw this, and Barbara Robinson, uh, who was a, came along later, uh, was also involved in all that administrative stuff, and, and store and um, record keeping and stuff. She, after his death, she organized the stuff that hadn't already been organized <laughs> by Lorraine, you know, the stuff that he collected over a bunch of years, you know. And the librarians received this and they said, gee, we don't have to do anything. <laughs> you know, it's all organized. Usually, you know, we get boxes out of the basement <laughs> and not only are they smelly, but they're all mixed up. So that, that collection, for historians, uh, it, it's really, really an astounding uh, piece of collection. I mean, it drove me crazy that he would not throw anything out, or Lorraine would not throw anything out. Uh, it, they moved from Pittsburgh out to the Institute in, uh, you know, right around 1962. And somewhere when I was already living in Seattle, you know, as an MD, I opened a desk drawer of hers, and there was a three-cent stamp that had been recovered from an envelope <laughs> because it hadn't been postmarked. <laughs> and I knew it was from a long time ago because I remember where the three cent postage was three, st was three cents. Um, Bar and Barbara's loyalty and the effort she put in, I wanted to recognize his appreciation of all that as well as rec recognize Lorraine for starting it and Barbara for finishing the, the collection. Um, I think I had a piece of that I'd like to read to you because it's kind of revealing. Um, you know, something that my brothers and I <laughs> very, very aware of. 
And it's not usual to put dedication on <laughs> a gift like this, but we said, you know, you have to put a long version of this in the finding document itself so that people will stumble across it. And in the catalog, you know, we want a short, a short version. So people know this, that somebody cared about this aspect of him. The collection of Jonas Salk papers is dedicated to the support staff, to the support staff who worked with Dr. Salk during his more than 50 year career. He shared with them lasting relationships of mutual respect and admiration. Special recognition is given to Lorraine C. Friedman and Barbara L. Robinson, whose personal efforts and dedication are primarily responsible for the existence, quality, and extent of this collection. That's the brief one. There's a longer version. Um, I saw him behave, act out, all of that. I got respect. Responses when I, when he was no longer around, and I stood in his place for some things or was doing something, and uh, back, I was visiting the Watson home. I was a trustee at the Watson home for a while, which is where the original studies were done, and they had a social gathering. A guy came up to me and he said, "I want to say hello. I want to introduce myself. I want to shake your hand." I worked on building the animal cages in the municipal hospital. The ones were, <laughs> the monkeys were kept. And he then talked about how difficult it was or something or other, and, he, and something about, you know, your father was nice guy, <laughs> supportive and stuff. I was in, uh, working with a roofer, happened to be on my dad's house after he died because it needed some work. And one of the guys came over to me and he said, <laughs> I just want you to know I worked on the waterproofing in what's now the basement of the Institute building. So, you know, your father would stop by all the time to see, see what the progress was, what was going on. Uh, that was, I learned something about, I mean, I'd seen it myself, but I learned something about the impact he had on people, just his presence. And uh, then there was the other aspect of what happened to me after he died and I stood in for him. I was a little kid at the time of the development of the vaccine. It, I, you know, for me, I, I didn't know what was going on. In fact, we didn't even talk about polio. It was not one of those scary things in, in our family. Um, and people would come up to me and want to touch me <laughs> because it was the closest thing they felt in connection with him. It was the experience they had had, you know, back in, in the 50s when this great relief happened and church bells rang and stuff, you know. Uh, I felt, I just, learned the depth of the importance to people uh, at that generation. They would thank me. I didn't do anything. Um, and I know from comments by some of the technicians in his laboratory who moved from Pittsburgh with him out to La Jolla, they commented on, what an incredible time it was in the laboratory then, working on that project. It was like, it was like a war was going on. <laughs> the focus, the work, the energy, <laughs> you know, this team, teamwork. Um, and that happened everywhere in the country related to this, what later became a moon project, but this project to fight polio just like a, today's fight against cancer, breast cancer, involved everybody. Everybody had a piece of it. The women who marched for dimes, the, 
the nurses who volunteered to take part in the program, the scientists who were working on other aspects of it. I hope someday to post a, um, an acknowledgement that I prepared for a display one time that didn't get used. But I knew, okay, everybody says he doesn't give credit. But do you know who does deserve credit? Do I have it? Where did I put it? It was here. Contributors to the development of the killed polio virus vaccine. I started with medical and scientific researchers, hundreds of physicians and investigators who his staff and colleagues contributed to the basic understanding. Dozens of lead scientists whose contributions of breakthrough studies provided tools and knowledge. The Virus Research Laboratory, the list of the names of the specific individuals, numerous other laboratory, glassware, and animal care technicians and, and assistants, University of Pittsburgh Administration and Facilities Support. All of these people, and it goes through other research colleagues, National Foundation, uh, the you know, administration uh, of it, uh, administrative, Basil O'Connor, administrative staff, thousands of volunteers, millions of donors. People were <laughs> so pleased when it worked. Their dimes had created this magical miracle thing. Um, early human studies, I list the people who were involved in those, you know, their names. And it gets to groups that are farther and farther away and bigger and bigger. The 1954 field trials, um, of course, the Vaccine Evaluation Center, University of Michigan, Tommy Francis, and all the people who were in it. The field personnel, 311 state and local health officials, 64 physical therapists, 22 CDC Epidemiological Intelligence Service officers, 39 laboratory investigators, 17 members of the advisory committee, thousands of participating medical personnel and volunteers, pharmaceutical companies, at least seven of them here that were involved in the early work. The polio, <laughs> I love this one. The polio pioneers, which was the little badge they got when people, in the, the kids in the field trial. 1,829,916 first, second, and third grade children who participated in the trials, approximately three and a half million parents who bravely consented to let their children participate in a double-blinded study with no guarantee of receiving the test vaccine and no certainty of any benefit, even if they did. I've been a parent now. <laughs> it wasn't just, you know, almost two million little kids. Double that number of parents made the decision to be involved. So. That's why there was such an incredible coming together and appreciation. You know, uh, unfortunately, from my father's perspective, he ended up being the icon, you know, the, the center, which they all insisted they needed a hero, okay? Um, but there were also major technical and social advancements during this pro development of this project. The Bureau of Biologics created uh, the whole idea, which is now a byword 
and the FDA, the process is the product. Before this, they were having to approve drugs that, okay, here it is, let's analyze it and see if it's what it's supposed to be. You can't do that with a biological product. You can have safety tests, okay? But and this is a point that Jonas made. Look, if you follow the procedure that I've done here, you'll be okay. Um, and that, so it's the process that's important. Don't go and wing it with various things. I don't know what it happens. I just know that this one works. Vaccine manufacturers, uh, just the, the whole process and the things that they learned, the regulatory uh, stuff that was going on. Fundraising, the incredible feats and advances in fundraising techniques with the March of Dimes, uh, you know, it was involved with and created. Um, pet food. <laughs> I spoke to somebody who had been involved in creating the monkey chow that was used. Um, there are more. <laughs> uh, legal issues, standards. Um, these were big changes that happened in this period of time I had no idea about. So for me, it was that's kind of astounding to uh, realize what it was like. I mean, they just come out of World War II, and now it was war against polio. And everybody pulled together, and everybody was involved, and everybody made contributions, you know, including all the people who made the technical advancements I'm talking about. And when I realized that was when I thought about who really contributed, <laughs> you know. And Jonas knew his place in it, <laughs> you know. He was pleased and deserves credit for, you know, Focusing on the principle and getting it done and organizing a team and all that stuff. But the product was a result of all of this other stuff. That was the product. As I said before, he was pleased with it, but he didn't feel like he owned it. Everybody owned it. It was part of everybody. And Murrow asked him that in the same interview. He said, um, so who owns the patent on the vaccine? Jonas was taken aback. He said, well, the people, I suppose. <laughs> Can you patent the sun? And by that he meant the sun belongs to everybody. You can't patent that. He was a novice at public <laughs> things to say, and it never occurred to him that the way it was taken by peers who didn't like him was he was comparing himself to the creator of the sun. <laughs> it was a title of a book, you know, and that was the point of having it in the title, you know, and that's one of the first books that, you know, presented Jonas in this sort of negative light, um, found all kinds of little stories and things, and, and of course, uh, the scientists who didn't get along with him, you know, were happy to talk about <laughs> talk about things. So I've covered a lot. <laughs> I haven't thought about it for a number of years, and so it surprises me how much <laughs> there really is there. Uh, it's an incredible story both back in the 1940s and 50s, and then this whole issue of live versus killed is so much more than just, you know, a front page story and a headline, an opportunity for scuttlebutt or whatever. It raises really big questions 
on immunization policy, on public health methods. I don't know what to do with it, but I am hoping that somebody sits down at a conference and says, how come? I've always wondered why. <laughs> this stuff that was pretty obvious, why didn't it have an impact? Where did we go wrong? Where did we go right? Not my field. You have presented such a wonderful and complete picture of the polio work and of your father and you. And I can't think of anything else that we could add to make it any better. It's just okay. wonderful the way you did it. I could probably come up with a story. All right. What do you do when somebody comes up to you and says, Salk, are you related to? <sighs> My mother, back in 1955, handed a charge card at that time, it was a little metal plate, handed it to <laughs> a salesperson. And you looked at it, and everybody knew the name right then, okay? It's like, oh, are you, are you related to Jonas Salk? And she said, only by marriage. <laughs> <laughs> She was sharp. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So I honor her. When people ask me, I often say, well, I say, yeah, he's my father. And they say, really? And I say, really? No. I say, That's what my mother tells me, and I have to take her word for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to end. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing all that with us. You're welcome. Thank you so much for the opportunity to revisit a subject that confused me while it was going on. And thanks for your own contributions. Thank you. Did I say that I suspect my greatest contribution to the whole thing? It's a two-minute conversation on the Atlantic City boardwalk. That instigated him to get back in it. That you talked about it in, towards the beginning. Yeah. But in retrospect, I think that was really an important contribution. And, <laughs> and that was yours. Yeah. Right. For instigating it. Yeah. Thank you for that, too. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs>